Okay, welcome back everybody. So again, this is our series of lectures on the basics of economic regulation. This is lecture eight in this series. Uh, there's a playlist on this if you, if you watch, should probably watch them all in order. In this lecture, we're gonna be talking about some of the issues that pop up when otherwise competitive industries are regulated. Now, as we talked about in a few earlier lectures, there are economic reasons to, to regulate businesses as well as industries in general. Uh, and we've discussed those in great depth already uh, in this series. But there are of course other reasons why industries and businesses are regulated, often for sociological reasons, uh, political reasons, combinations thereof, and so on. Okay, And as economists, uh, you know, our, our role is to sort of understand what the likely effects of those are going to be and how we might mitigate them. So that's what we're uh, going to talk about today. Now, to get started in this sort of lecture, right, we should first review the, I quickly <laughs> review some of the things associated with perfect competition. So Competitive industries generally produce at minimum of their average costs. Uh, that generally corresponds to their marginal costs. They generally face flat-ish demand curves. That is to say they, they can't affect price one way or another. Right? So an individual firm can't bring prices up or down. Like an individual gasoline station can't decide to raise prices um, because people would just go to the, the one next door. And, and they can't lower them because then they would lose money. Uh, they generally earn a competitive rate of return. That is to say, they, they don't earn excessive profits and, and they have to earn a certain amount of profits. In other words, it's a very sort of tidy arrangement from a microeconomic perspective because a lot of sort of problems fix themselves. However, from that, we can, we can say that if price is set at some difference from where the competitive price would be and if it's a competitive market, this allows us to do a lot of analysis, right? Now, generally speaking, uh, the further the regulated price deviates from marginal cost, okay, so the marginal cost of, of production, the greater the welfare loss to society is. Now, that is all things being equal, right? And, and some of you may be saying, well, what about demand? Obviously, yes, that's right. So if that's holding demand, constant as well as everything else, right? We can sort of formalize that and see that here. So I'm going to use the cursor. You'll forgive me on that. Let's say that this is a uh, relatively large market and uh, that if it were competitive, it's, there's no, you know, it would be competitive. There's no regulation. It would produce at P star, Q star. Okay. And uh, the individual firm would produce at Q hat. Okay, so this amount here. Okay, and uh, furthermore, let's let's say that you know that this this Q here is such that this is this Q star is twenty Q hat. Okay, so this um, market is going to be divided up by twenty equally sized firms, all with the average cost relationship. ACQ. Okay? Right? So you can imagine this industry sort of has 20 businesses operating. They all sort of look the same. They produce a homogeneous product, right? All things that sort of go with perfect competition. Uh, they divide up the market demand equally uh, amongst themselves. If there were more firms, some would lose money. If there were less firms, they would make a profit bringing other firms in. Okay. Let's then say that the price is regulated to be P bar. Okay, so for some reason society or politicians or both want prices to be greater than they, they would be in this market otherwise. Okay, uh, the demand of course is going to fall off to a certain amount, right, given price elasticity of demand. Let's say it falls off to Q bar. Okay, so there is a loss in uh, output of the difference between Q star and Q bar. So <clears throat> if we take Q bar and we divide that by 20, okay, so this is Q bar divided by 20, right? So all the firms that, that were 
that were there operating before, they continue to operate, right? Okay, and where do they produce on their average cost curve? Well, now they're producing here, okay? Because that's Q bar divided by 20. So each firm shrinks a little bit, right? But uh, in fact, they end up now earning a greater profit. Each of them earns a greater profit per unit than they would have before. The fact that we've regulated the price higher than it would be in this competitive market results in all firms operating at a slightly smaller scale, which results in them operating at somewhat less than minimum efficient scale. They're operating with a higher cost structure, that is to say. Um, but you know those firms are going to earn more profit than they did before as well. So we see a movement of <coughs> excuse me, we see a movement of benefit from consumers to producers. Okay. Another interesting result that occurs um, in these situations where we're regulating otherwise competitive markets uh, is is this presented here, right? So let's say that we're regulating. Uh, we, we've got we've got two types of firms, type one and type two, and we've got two products A and B, right? Uh, we're we're not so concerned with product B at this point. Okay. We're primarily concerned with the two types of firms and product A. So let's take a hypothetical example of say the product is housing. Okay. And we've got two types of firms that produce sort of solid structure housing or can can produce it, right? We've got type 1 firms and let's say that these are traditional home builders. And then maybe we have type 2 firms that you know usually build like camper homes or you know mobile homes homes that you can sort of move around or carry behind your car um, they, they can produce houses too they they have sort of everything that they need to produce but it's not their main main line of business and as a consequence type 2 firms produce at at a higher unit cost all things be equal when they produce fixed housing Right, so the type fir one firms they're really sort of the specialists in producing traditional housing, but in a pinch, in a difficult situation, type two firms can do that as well. They do it at a higher cost. Okay, let's say then that we regulate the price of houses to be minimized, or the minimum price of housing is P bar. Okay, interesting result happens here. Okay, so. What ends up happening before I get into the graphical analysis is that we'll, we're going to find that although the initial regulation reduces consumer welfare for the reasons that we just saw right in the in the previous slide, two slides ago, if we add additional regulation in this case, we can end up increasing uh, total social welfare. Uh, so it's what we see when we start moving away from perfect competition by regulation is a lot of times we can we can create regulation that has these countervailing forces, right? Which is it's kind of neat, right? And what we should take away from this as as students of regulatory theory is that we really really need to think through the likely or anticipated impacts of any marginal unit of regulation. Okay, uh, you need to think it through very carefully. All right, so let's let's walk through this little counterintuitive example. So we've got one demand curve here for housing or product A. Okay, and the type one firms can produce at C1. Right, so it's constant marginal cost. Just a simple simple sort of example. If the market were competitive. Um, you know, it, it would produce here, right? Okay, and it would produce this quantity of housing at at this price. Okay, and uh, but we put a, put a regulation on housing saying, okay, well, prices of housing can't be less than than p p bar, right? But and here's the the tricky thing, right? We only put that regulation on traditional housing providers. So this is another really thing that we haven't touched upon uh, to this point, and it's worth delving into now in class, right? So in the physical classes where we're going to talk about this a lot more, but who you regulate 
matters a lot, right? And as economists, often we neglect this idea, but as a practicing reg regulator formerly now, <laughs> I can tell you it's extremely important, right? So we'll, we'll say, you know, we'll sort of talk about regulation in the abstract and economics, but in terms of how we set up regulation and how the law works, right? Let's say we have a regulation saying the prices must be this amount, okay? Well, who does that apply to? Does it apply to, to anybody who produces that product? Well, how do you define that product? If a house has wheels, is it still a house? Or is it now, um, you know, a, a vehicle of some sort? Well, okay, it's a vehicle now, not a house, so the regulation doesn't apply to me. Because, of course, producers have every incentive to avoid regulations that have costs. And they similarly have every incentive to opt in to markets that are subsidized. Okay. So the sort of structure of who you apply the regulation to is extremely important. Okay. All right. So let's get back into this story here, right? So we've, we're going to say that prices have to be P bar, and we're going to apply that regulation to traditional housing producers. Okay. Well, what happens then is we've got these type two providers of housing. So maybe these are people who normally make campers or things like this or tents or whatever. And they can produce regular housing too, but they, they can do it at a higher, higher cost than, than the traditional. Okay, well, if the regulated price is here, these alternative suppliers can hop into this market, produce this, so basically capture the entire market, produce at quantity Q1. Okay, which ends up being higher than the competitive cost would be, but it's lower than what the regulated firms can provide at. So in other words, what's happening is the regulated firms are sort of shut out of the market that they traditionally operate in. Alternative suppliers are able to come in and sort of meet the market demand that exists at their higher cost. Okay. If instead we apply the regulation to all firms that might produce, so we're not applying it to firms that traditionally produce this type of housing, we're going to instead make the regulation anything that can be considered a house, whether it's traditional or not, okay, the regulation is going to apply to those suppliers. Okay. Then what we effectively do is we shift everybody up into this price and quantity. So of course there's a further reduction in consumer welfare. However, you'll notice that each time we're doing this, we're modifying our regulatory profits are going up. Okay, so who's going to supply Q bar? Is it going to be type one or type two? Well, of course, it's going to be all the type one firms. The type one firms are now going to come back because, of course, they can produce at a higher profit than type two firms. Okay, and so this area here becomes sort of industry profit. So if we were to sketch the whole thing out very quickly, this is initial consumer surplus, zero consumer, so excuse me, this is all consumer surplus, zero producer surplus. Okay, when the um, initial regulation comes in that affects the traditional suppliers, but not non-traditional alternative suppliers, okay, the consumer surplus moves to this triangular area and producer surplus uh, is of a zero, right? Okay, so there's a reduction in consumer surplus um, here. Okay, that area again here. Okay, now when we apply the regulation most broadly to everybody, right? So anybody who makes a house right now not applies. Okay, consumer surplus falls to this triangular area here, but producer surplus rises to this rectangular area here giving you a net gain in social welfare of the difference between this area here, which is our plus, and this area here, which is our marginal minus, this being bigger than this, okay? So long as demand elasticity is such, right, that this is smaller than this, we have a net gain in consumer welfare. Now, it's possible that demand is very inelastic, right, and this box ends up being less than this, or that these, these these prices are such that this difference is very little here, 
Um, so there's a variety of ways in which it, it might not end up increasing total social welfare, but in this case, right, in this case, there's, there's no question. Okay, so let's shift gears now for a little bit and talk about the effects of entry and exit regulation, which also is, produces a lot of sort of interesting results like the ones that we just saw. Let's consider a market where the minimum efficient scale is large relative to market demand, right? So, so this is an, an industry where there's just going to be a few firms, right? How many? We, we don't really care, right? Um, but, but there's going to be a few firms. So let's so say maybe three, four, five, six, something like that. And let's further say that the demand in this industry looks like this, right? The costs look like this, right? Which is, this is very linear, this is linear, this is linear, right? It's very easy to draw, right? Just that, right? Just, just like what we just saw a moment ago. And then finally, let's assume that there's an entry cost in this industry of $150. Okay. So, you know, maybe like they have, they have to get set up or maybe there's some, some licenses they need to buy or something like that. It costs $150. Okay. If we plop up, you know, plop this down into a corn, corn, excuse me, a Cornell model. And just to quickly review, so if you, if you Google search Cornell, 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 if you Google search Cornell model, you can quickly find what it is and how it works and go into it, right? It's something you cover in first year microeconomics. So we're not, not going to cover it here, but uh, suffice to say, it's, it's, it's a model where you have at least two firms. Traditionally, it's just two firms, but you can do with more than two. Okay. Where you have two firms and each firm optimizes its output uh, given the optimization of the other firm, right? So one firm sets their output at whatever's optimal to them. And then the second firm responds to that optimal output, optimizing for themselves. But then of course the first firm has to reset because there's now another firm and then they go back and forth, right? And eventually what happens is they achieve a sort of stable result where they sort of split the market up in half. Okay. So of course you can do this with, with n number of firms too. And, and what you find when you play this, right, is that the number of firms increases, right? The, the equilibrium Cornell solution approaches the competitive solution. Suffice so it in this case, we're not gonna get to that because of some minor mathematical complications. Uh, <laughs> math nerds are like, yeah, of course, it's linear, right? Okay, um, so here's our sort of results down here. Okay, so on the left we have number of firms right here is the sort of prices that those firms end up selling at this is the firm profit right this is the associated consumer surplus so basically what we're doing is we're re we just saw how we calculate producer and consumer surplus a moment ago from these sort of changes right we just keep doing this over and over again as firms enter this is our total wealth social welfare which is our sum of our consumer and producer surplus okay all right wonderful We'll see that firms will continue to enter this until there is, um, there's, there's no incentive to do so, right? So there's no profit, right? And that occurs at six firms. We can see that here because if a seventh firm enters profits uh, for, for, for all the firms is, is negative 23, including the seventh entrance. So there's no, no sense in the seventh business getting into this game. Uh, we'll note that the price is 23, right? Uh, the consumer surplus there is 29.76, and total social welfare is 30.67. Now that's an equilibrium situation in a Cornell model because there's no uh, further incentive to divide up the market. So the firms are all dividing up the market evenly. They're all optimizing their output given what the other firms are doing, uh, and and there's no incentive to leave, right? Because everybody's making money. Right. So to a certain degree, everybody's sort of happy with this situation. It's going to be sort of stuck, uh, if you will. OK, but we can also see that, in fact, social welfare would be optimized if there were only three firms. Now, of course, prices are higher at three firms than six. Right. We can see that, uh, however, firm profit is considerably higher. And the variation in consumer surplus uh, is also substantial, but given the number of firms in operation, right, which is three times this, right, the sum of firm profits and consumer surplus 
ends up being greater here than it is here. Okay, And this is sort of an interesting result whereby if we in fact regulated the price up in this case, right? So if we set the price at 33 rather than 23, or say somewhere anywhere between 33 and 28, right? It could be 30, right? If we regulate the price there, in fact, we're going to increase total social welfare. Now, some of you might be objecting to this and, and give it, you might still be grumbly from the last slide and say, well, wait a second, firm profits, blah, 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 blah. You know, that's not good for society or whatever. Yeah, but the fact that the firm earned the profits, okay, so the state can tax those, right, and then redistribute them back. So, like, let's just say, you could say, like, everybody who bought a product in Industry X, you now get a tax rebate, <laughs> right? Okay, so so there are, there are ways to move those surpluses around society if, if, you know, if you want, right, if you want to do that. So that's why it's important that we consider sort of total surpluses, all right? Okay, so, and now some of you may be saying, yeah, but politics, okay, right, but that's, this is economics, right? We're not, we're not here to, to, to sort of have that debate, right? Um, suffice it to say, from an economics perspective, it's possible to put those benefits wherever you want them. All right, you being society. <laughs> okay, all right, so this is an interesting result, right? We're actually going to boost surpluses by by reducing the number of firms and actually by regulating the price away from, you know, it was actually approaching a competitive price, right? Uh, and, and that's just an illustration of the same thing we just saw a moment ago, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, sort of level zero economics will tell you things like, oh, anytime there's a regulation, it, it creates bads, right? And, you know, from a certain narrow perspective, that's true, but we sort of sort of back away from that and we think sort of more in the aggregate, uh, it's definitely not always true, even from a sort of cold-hearted, raw economic perspective. Okay, hey there, everybody. So I think we're going to cut that one there, right? We're going to make part two on this video because we had a long way to go on this topic, and this video is getting pretty long already. So I hope you'll join me there in Lecture 8, Part 2. Uh, so, um, yeah, see you there. Take care, everybody.